All right, everybody, welcome to the Leadership Mastermind Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Peek, and this is my co-host, Laura Brandeo. Good morning, Laura. Hello, good morning, Mitch. So happy to be here and very excited for our guest today. I would like to introduce everyone to Johnny Quinn. He is a professional speaker who travels the globe to inspire audiences by delivering thought-provoking, and action-packed messages to businesses, schools, and organizations. He is a U.S. Olympian in the sport of bobsledding and competed in the 2014 Winter Olympics. Johnny is also a former professional football player, spending his time with the NFL's Buffalo Bills and Green Bay Packers. He also is a member of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders of the CFL. He's one of only three people who played in the NFL and competed in the Winter Olympics. He also is a TED Talk speaker where he spoke about understanding the Olympic mindset and the author of Push Breaking Through Barriers. When Johnny is not speaking, he also owns and operates the Johnny Quinn Insurance Agency, helping families all across the state of Texas with their insurance needs. Well, on the Leadership Mastermind podcast, we want to provide our audience with insights and perspectives from our industry experts and outside our industry so they can learn grow and be inspired to be a leader to their clients, their teams, and their selves. All right, Mitch, let's get ready to dive in. All right. Welcome aboard, Johnny. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. And Laura, thank you for such a, a warm introduction. That was awesome. <laughs> well, you were easy. There was a lot of information there, Johnny. And, and I will tell you, absolutely loved the TED Talk. Thank it you. was um, very you, inspiring. Absolutely enjoyed it. And I did read your book also. So oh, you're too I've sweet. into lots of things. All Thank right, you. Mitch. All right. Well, uh, Johnny, we'll jump right in. And uh, the big question we like to ask all of our guests, and, and you've been through a lot of different phases in your life, so I think you have some great insights to this. What are your three key pillars to leadership that you've taken from being an Olympian, being an NFL player, being an owner of an insurance agency, and a, and a TEDx speaker? Yeah. So, you know, what's been interesting is I've been fortunate to be around with what I would call ultra performers. These are men and women, um, whether in sport and business, who find a way to get the job done with the current resources available. And what that does is it, it gets rid of excuses. And I, I got this concept from a guy that I follow and I look at him as a, as a mentor. Um, his name's Donald Miller out of Nashville, and he talks about um, what does it mean to be a value-driven professional? And there's three things to that. The, the three pillars is what we'll walk through. And I'll, 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 here are the three. Number one is you have to have the ability to make money. Uh, and I say that from an, uh, not from an a, um, arrogant or greedy standpoint. We'll, we'll unpack what that means. But a value-driven professional has to understand how to make money. Uh, the second thing they have to do is they've got to be able to reduce frustration. And then the third thing is they need to be able to solve problems. Mitch, Laura, if you can make money, reduce frustration, and solve problems for your clients, your leadership will exponentially grow out of the roof. I mean, it, it'll be unbelievable. And so those are the three things I think we can have fun and unpack and what, what that means. Yes, those are great. And as you're saying that, I am literally thinking about the mortgage industry because part of the mortgage industry and real estate, isn't it all of those things, right? It's problem solving. It's it's getting into reducing frustration in a world of so much uncertainty, yeah. right? You have families coming to us saying, I don't know what the next step is. I'm unsure of what's going to happen. So if you are able to reduce that frustration, be able to solve problems that might pop up, well, obviously that also ties to you will be very successful and have the ability to generate revenue. That's right. So, wow. Well, wow. and, here, and here's the thing. Here's what's interesting. I don't list make money as number three. I put it. I put it at the top because everybody mm -hmm. on on the team in your organization, whether you're on the front line, client facing, or you're on the back end working B two B, it does not matter. Everybody needs to be on the same page and understand that our role, you know, on this team, is to ethically maximize the wealth of the organization, and, and we need to understand that. We need to understand input outflow. Right? We, we need to understand that our efforts and what we do cost money 
and are we making money? And so I don't leave that as number three. Right. Uh, what we need to address this out of the gate is that my role, I've, I'm, I'm either reducing you know, outflow capital or I'm bringing more in, but everything matters. It's like flying an airplane. Some of us are a pilot. Some of us are the, are the flight staff. Some of us are sitting you know, in, in coach. It doesn't matter. The money keeps the plane up in the air flying. So I don't care where your seat is on your team or on your organization. We have to have this proper understanding of money. And I, I think that's where a lot of people miss out. You know, uh, if, if we take a $100 bill, a $100 bill is amoral, meaning it has no feelings whatsoever. You can do something really good with a $100 bill, or you can do something really bad with a $100 bill. It's up to the, the user who has the $100 bill in their hand. It's the same thing in business. And I'd echo, it's the same thing in leadership. Do you understand how money works? Right? We don't, don't show up to collect a paycheck. And I, I see this more on people who are more salary-based and not commission, is you've got to understand if, if you're on the salary side, everything you do matters. And we have to have this proper understanding on, on money. And so one of the things I talk to my team about all the time, you know, every day is, hey, when you come to the office, we are looking to ethically maximize the wealth of this agency. That, 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 that's what we're looking to do. Now, how we do that? Well, we reduce frustration, we solve problems. But I, 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 it, this is huge in, in the day and age that we live in. And you know, as we navigate through COVID, uh, and some industries have flourished, some have just tanked, is we need this proper understanding of how money works and your role in a, on a team or in an organization matters because it affects the bottom line. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I worked for a big organization uh, a long time ago, and it was they brought in a new CEO, and he was a uh, forensic accountant, <laughs> you know, and he had done things with uh, FBI and all this. And, you know, he rolls into the parking lot and parks his Maserati in the front parking spot. And then he comes in and talks about, you know, how they got to cut costs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, eh, yeah. you know that, that, yeah. that didn't go over too well with the uh, people right. sitting in the cubicles. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, so I, I know what you're saying, and it, and I think a lot of it has to do how do you interpret that to your team to make right. it, you know, so that they understand it in a yeah. in a good way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, if we think about what I love about teams and organizations is that you have people that have different backgrounds, different belief systems, different personalities, right? And you're all coming together for one common goal. Well. We know that everybody has different experiences in life, so I don't know their background on understanding how money works or how money works within a business. And so it's just an important understand a foundational truth, just like you would build a home. The foundation is just so structurally important, right? Otherwise, the house collapsed. It's for everybody on the team to have this foundation of, of understanding how money flows and works in the business. Um, and you know, to, to your point, Mitch, what happens when, when what, what you were saying right there is is essentially when words and actions don't line up, right? That, and that, right. that you can use that in any 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 form. You just happen to use that. That was a good example. But when words and actions don't line up, what happens is there's confusion. Trust is broken. Things fall apart, right? You, 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 the the message that you know that guy came in and was sharing. It's like, well, wait a second. You know, th things aren't lining up here. So <laughs> right. you know, you, you want transparency. You want clarity. And in a business, we've got we need everybody to understand the importance and the flow of capital. We really do. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting take because to Mitch's point, you know, with your example, is that it's one of those things that in society sometimes people are uncomfortable. Right. looking at things in that perspective, right? Now, it's absolutely, you know, from a leadership standpoint or from an ownership standpoint, absolutely tie in. How do you, is it a matter of just making sure that each person understands the importance of their role and how it ties into the team to the ultimate goal? Is that how you approach it when you're not at an executive level or a sales level? Because of course, anyone in sales, their mind already thinks that way, right? right They're right. already driven to think that way. But yeah. like you mentioned, the salary employee, mm -hmm. how do you resonate there? How do you communicate that? 
Laura, I'm, I'm so glad we're unpacking that because you're right. What we don't want our listeners to think, especially if you're the executive level, is we don't need to roll out the, the, the financial script on, you know, here's, and, and that remains private and, and, and things like that. It is this understanding, whether you're in a sales role or a salary role, that your compensation is connected to existing business and prospective business. And so it's it's being extremely clear to showing where the the, the you know if we grow you're going to get more help if we don't grow uh, more responsibility is going to be added to your plate right and, and and we risk risk overworking we risk you know things falling through the cracks and so it, it's tying um, you know at, at a uh, maybe a, again a foundational level showing that um, there are rewards when we grow but there are also penalties when we lose business. And we've got to talk about both sides. Well, let me ask you this, Johnny. Obviously, you've had a history in sports. So as an NFL player and, and as an Olympic athlete on a team, how has that helped you shape your business and, and the way you run things? Yeah, you know, it was so interesting. When I made the switch from um, professional football to uh, Olympic sports, and Laura, you might remember this from my TEDx <laughs> talk, is that – um, you know, I go from an industry that gets paid and paid very well to an industry that has no money. And unless you're a Michael Phelps or Simone Biles and you got Subway and Under Armour back in you, when you come out and say, hey, I'm a Texas bobsledder, people say, what in the world is that? Right. So, <laughs> you know, it, it uh, that, that was uh, that was quite the adjustment. But what it did and, and I, I, I mentioned this just briefly, you know, right after the introduction, when, when I moved to this sport that there was no compensation. I had to get creative. I had to raise money through sponsorships. I had to find a way to uh, generate income in the off season uh, so I could fund, you know, a bobsledding career. I had people come on board to, to help help out. Is that it helped me understand in business that you can get creative on how you run your business, right? Industry standards can be so deadly where you, you fall into this this lot this uh, thinking of complacency of well this is you know this is industry standards nobody else does it different you don't want to, you don't want to come across as a rule breaker and what I realized is that ultra performers men and women in sport and business is that they find a way to get the job done with the current resources available it's one of the first things I said and seeing that happen in sport I've been able to to, to do that in business. Right. If, if we're going to invest in some software or we need to invest in team help um, and, and bring more staff on, you know, if, if, if it's in the budget, we're going to do it. But if it's not, here's where we lose some people. If it's not, we're going to find a way to get the job done with the current resources available. And, and what that does, Mitch and Laura, it gets rid of all the excuses. It gets rid of looking at everybody else and different team sizes and different budgets. And well, they're doing this and they've got this. What it does is it robs you of the gifts that you have and the gifts that your team, your business, your organization, what you guys have together. And so finding creative ways to continue to push your business, I learned that through sport. Yeah. That makes such sense. And I will tell you, that's one of the things that our industry learned in 2020. Yeah. I mean, we were faced with, okay, everyone's going remote. It has to be a complete digital experience, yeah. right? Yeah. And the mortgage industry had more volume than we had ever seen in our entire lifetimes. And we had to figure out how to satisfy that production yeah. with the same amount of people we had or training brand new people. Right. So. I almost think you're so right. And getting creative, I, complacency turns you into a dinosaur. We all know that. The yeah. minute you get into that mindset, it's the beginning of the end. Yeah. So how do you recommend people continue to challenge themselves and right. keep that creativity? Because yeah. sometimes you don't realize you're becoming complacent until you've almost become too complacent. You know what's interesting, Laura, is is success can create complacency. So it's I one of those agree. things right, that we have to watch watch for. And you know, you, you're right. The, the the mortgage space, and I'd say even um, you know, top realtors. Yep. I, I'm in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Had an unbelievable year. Unbelievable, right? So the 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 um, 
the potential that we've got to watch out for is okay is that sustainable um you know how do we make sure that we don't get complacent and and i'll um i'm, I'm gonna give you two words that that i that that i'll share with that and and this will be a great direction is is what we have to do is if you've if you've accomplished major milestones right many people have banner years last year fantastic that's great what i want you to do is i want you and here they are i want you to borrow wisdom Right? I want you to, listeners, write that down. And what I mean by that is I want you to seek out men or women in your industry that are three, four, five steps down the road you want to go. And I realize you had a banner year last year, and this year is going to be even better. Are, are, are you borrowing wisdom? Are, are, are you learning from men and women who are further along in their career than you are that, that you can tap into and borrow their wisdom. Now, now Laura, here's here's what I mean. I I, I mean, are, what are you watching? What are you reading? Who are you listening to? Right? I'm not meaning. Are you calling somebody up? Hey, can I get 20 minutes of your time and let's go get some coffee? No. If that if you can, great. Most people can't. What I'm just asking is, you know, a, a lot of the people who are industry titans have written books, have podcasts, have blogs. Right? We're doing a podcast right now. Are you consuming the content so you stay fresh? Right? So you stay Absolutely. hungry. Right? So so you stay active and engaged because that is the potential downfall with success is you get complacent you take your foot off the gas right <laughs> yep there's there's a lot of people that have their heads buried in their work right now and they're thinking you know i'm closing all these loans closing all yep. these loans that's all they're doing they're not you know they're not upping their game they're not like you said reading books yeah. you know consuming podcasts you know things like that so um as a leader as a team leader um answer me this so how much of the team's opinion do you take into account when you're starting to make changes in your business, when it comes to technology, when it comes to processes, things like that? Mitch, that's, that's so funny you, you bring that up um, this morning. So every, every morning at 9 a.m. we have a team meeting and we purchase software in December. And so we're at the 90 day mark and we spent a good 30 minutes of the team meeting literally about an hour ago. Uh, discussing, hey, is this software working? Hey, what, what, um, how's the inputting going? Right, because we purchased some sales software for our industry that helps kind of rank clients and you know what can close quicker and, and things like that. So we're just not you know making cold calls. We're we're going after warm warmer leads, and you know in these meetings, Mitch, I, I, I'm all ears. You know, tell me, you're the one entering into the database. You, you're the one, you know, on, on the phone with the client. And so I'm listening and I'm understanding and I'm getting different perspectives. And so as a team leader, it's it's my my job and my responsibility is to filter through that. What is truthful? What is exaggerated? What is anger? <laughs> well, yeah, what, what is anger? Right. <laughs> what is anger? Um, what, what is true frustration? You know, can we alleviate that? And, um, you know, I guess a, a foundational diagnostic that I look for is, are we, are we leaning our processes or do we have so many steps there that something can, can fall through? And so that's really, I, you know, I'm in the middle of that right now with this new software is, okay, is this, is this, is this just a, a headache that we need to work through? Or is this a um, is this something that we need to lean out and and we can pivot to to something different? And so I think with that, Mitch, is it's it's an ongoing um, information gather. And, and here's here's what's going to have to happen: we're going to need to gather as much information as we can, and make the wisest decision that we can, and then go with it. Right. See what I see happen sometimes is people they get it's all this information gathered, nothing happens because they still want to gather more information. At some point, we got to take some action. I'm not saying we run in there, guns blazing, let's act crazy and just cancel all the software, purchase every software company. No, it's it's let's let's download as much information from you that you can, and then you, you make the the wisest decision possible, and you move. You freaking move. That's what you do. All right. So you just used the word action. So let's <laughs> let's dive into yeah, action. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. So you spoke about ultra performers, mm -hmm. so, you know, whether that's in business, whether that's in sports, whether that's in life. OK, yeah. so what holds people back? I mean, this is I, I probably could could say that I say this daily, that one of the things I cannot figure out is why 
some people, they have it here. They, they've got the idea. They know what to do, but they're afraid to take that leap of action. So yeah. what have you seen that holds people back from that? Laura, that, that's such a good, good um, comment to break down, to understand that. I, you know, what is just so interesting is that we all have the same amount of time, right? Everybody comes to the table resourced differently. You know, everybody's been, been brought up differently. Some have ample resources, some don't. But the great equalizer is time. And when I started to understand that, and I learned that when I got to, into professional sports, is that the ultra performers, right? They, they maximize their time. And when you maximize your time, you're in a better position to take action. So, Laura, and this is something we can unpack because I, I don't have the, the correct answer. I think I have some... Uh, some direction that we can take, and I can walk you through what I do, but is, you know, I think some people are just scared because they, so too. Right? they haven't developed, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, I don't know, I started, you know, in sports, it's all about lifting weights to get stronger for your sport. I started lifting weights in seventh grade. And so, you know, my first time in the weight room, I'm, I'm, I'm a young middle yeah, schooler. Yeah. I, look, I look confused. I'm You're like, awkward. I don't even know, right? Awkward. I don't know what I'm doing. But I, I had to kind of cut my teeth, you know, in the weight room, and then you get into freshman and then varsity and college. And now, you know, when I got to the, the NFL and the Olympics, I'm, I'm a veteran in the weight room. I know every move, every exercise. But I, 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 I cut my teeth on that. Laura, I think some people just haven't cut their teeth. Right? I, I think some people, um, you know, haven't, haven't risked it. And, and here's what's so interesting. When I got cut, I got cut three times in the NFL or two NFL, one the CFL, so three in professional sports. It hurt. I mean, it was devastating to lose that those contracts uh, for my career to come to an end. It hurt. But w but when I was able to take that failure and understand that failure is actually a precursor to future success, yeah. if I allow it, right? right? If I take what I learned, I can use that to springboard a future success. And, and, you know, when I, at age 30, when I became a U.S. Olympian in the world of pro sports, they start to call 30 old. So in 2014, I turned 30. I go to the Olympics. Um, I'm wearing the red, white, and blue. I'm representing our, our, our country on the world's greatest stage athletically. I was able to look back and say, wait a second, that failure prepared me for what yeah. came. And so, I, you know, I take that approach. Um, in business, right, and different struggles and things like that is, hey, what can I learn here? What can I move forward? So to kind of tie this thing back together, Laura, is in order for people to take action, I need them to be time maximizers. Mm -hmm. Or are they just drifting throughout the day, right? They're there. They're logged in remotely. But are they maximizing time? And here's where I think it starts. I think it starts with a morning routine. Agreed. Right. I think it starts with um, mm -hmm. what you do right when you get up. And so if, if anybody listening here, if you'd like to see my morning routine, I've written it down. It's at my website, johnnyquenusa.com. And then you can just click on articles, top right hand corner where every menu is on, on a website. Click on articles and you can see my morning routine. And, and I lay out the first two hours of what I do uh, every single morning. Um, I'm not perfect at it, but I am consistent. And what it does is it puts me in a position to win the day, to take action. And I got this concept from a guy by the name of Darren Hardy. He wrote a book called The Compound Effect. And he talked yeah. about these bookends, right? He talked about you got the morning, you got the evening. Sometimes during the day it can be chaos, right? It can be chaotic. But if you can control the bookends, which we all can, then you're going to put yourself in a position to be successful and win. And so that's what I've done. You can read my bookends, johnnyquinusa.com. Click on articles, and you can see my morning routine, and you can actually see my evening routine. I have both of them there. And, you know, that's a good point because I think everybody has a routine, whether they know it or not. Yeah. You know, they, everybody has a morning routine and an evening routine. The question is, is it productive? Is it helpful yeah. for your day? Yeah. Um, is it you know, intentional? Yeah, is it intentional? Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, let, let's get off topic just a little bit here, because I think my audience would be upset with me if I didn't ask you about <laughs> about the incident 
and Russia. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I saw your post and, and it really got me thinking because I remember this story well. So tell us what happened with the uh, the bathroom incident. <laughs> yeah. So crazy, crazy. I'm in the Olympic Games. We just walked in opening ceremonies. I mean, it was an unbelievable night, right? You're, you're there at the Olympics. They they they, uh, they bring in the Olympic flame and it's just the, the adrenaline is out of the roof. So it was the, the next day, right? We're, we're coming down from this high from, from walking and opening ceremonies. And I'm, I'm in the Olympic Village taking a shower and um, I get out of the shower and I, I can't get out of my bathroom. The bathroom door is is jammed. So, you know, I'm checking the, the little lock thing and it's it's unlocked and I'm, you know, going up and down. I'm pushing, you know, I'm doing everything I can and, and um, it's locked. And so my roommate at the time, he was in the weight room. And so it was just me and, and, and my room in the village. It was interesting because the the, the 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 rooms run parallel to a hallway. So I'm kind of like banging on things to see if somebody in the hallway can, you know, hear me come render raid. And I get to the door and I, you know, I hit it, I hit it and it cracks. And so I wind back and just throw a full fist through there and my fist goes right through the door. <laughs> and so at this point I can see I, I can see in you know the light into the room. And so I'm like, well, I'm gonna get out of here. So I can, you know, I kind of, you know, chisel the, the door apart with my with my, you know, I don't know palm or whatever and so i get out and um you know i i you know i look at the door i'm like oh my gosh I, i'm gonna you know i broke down a door i'm gonna be in trouble here so i, I take a picture i go down to the uh usoc or, or olympic committee's office and said because i didn't want them to think we were you know rough housing or whatever <laughs> so i just say hey ran into an issue with my door um couldn't get out ended up having to you know break it down i just want to let you know do we need to get a service staff in here to get it you know replaced and, you know, Mitch, we've been connected on social media for a little bit. I got a pretty good sense of humor. So I just, I put the picture on social media and I mean, that thing that just took off like a firecracker, the BBC took it and then it went to Yahoo. And then uh, within 24 hours, it was seen by uh, 10 million people around the world, wow. retweeted 28,000 times. I mean, it was just <laughs> crazy. Well, the, the, the buildup to it was, is there was a lot of reports of, yeah. Yeah. of yeah. quality issues. Quality issues, yeah. yeah. Quality yep. issues, and then you just- Things not that. being ready, yep. yep. Yeah, yep. you just took the quality issue yeah. to a whole new <laughs> level, and it just, it, yeah. it created a firestorm. Yeah. So oh. I, yeah, the timing, the, the timing of the media and all that play, yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> But yeah, I, you know, now I think back, I, you know, clearly remember that story in the news everywhere, you know, yeah. U.S. Olympic athlete, you know, breaks out of bathroom or yeah. whatever the, the headline read. And you know, what's so funny is that every two years, you know, there's an Olympic Games, although last year it got moved to COVID, so it'll be this summer, is, you know, in, so we were in 2014, it was Sochi not being ready facility-wise, 2016 was Rio, and it was kind of like water contamination. Yeah. 2018 was in South Korea, so it was like the North Korea border deal. So I, I get, you know, they relive some of these stories from previous Olympics. So every two years, I kind of get a boost, and, and my Twitter just goes crazy because it comes back up, and and uh, it's pretty funny. It's yeah, because you're, you're part of that, uh, you know, issues of quality yeah. that they had right, over yeah, there. Right, 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 right. So. Uh, yeah, that I got a good kick out of that story, and I figured our audience would uh, like to to relive it with you. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so tell us, how did you go from NFL athlete to Olympic bobsledder living in Texas? It, it reminds me of the Jamaican bobsled team. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like, like how, does this, how does this yeah. happen? Yeah. Well, you just watched the movie Cool Runnings over and over and over again right now. My, um, It was interesting. Some things started to line up. So football didn't go the way that I thought it would go when I got into the professional sport, you know, to the league. Um, I just couldn't find a way to, 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 to stick. And the, the tipping point was I blew my knee out in Canada. And so that was the last straw on the football side. And so when I got healthy, I, I, I recovered, got medically cleared. Mitch, I knew I still had something left in the tank, right? But I couldn't find a football team to give me a chance because I had three cuts and a, and a battered knee. At that point, I looked like damaged goods on paper. So um, some things starting to line up. My my mom, one of her coworkers, was a bobsledder from the 2010 Winter Olympics. And then my agent, he represented a bobsledder back in the day at the 2002 Winter Olympics as a, as a, a bobsled driver. And because there's no NCAA level bobsledding, right? There's no, you don't go to college to bobsled. They, they recruit from typically, I mean, they'll recruit from any sport, but football and track and field are the two main sports they recruit from. You need power and you need speed. Right. And so I, I did both in college. And so I kind of fit the mold 
on um, you know what they look for. I kind of had to build. And uh, so I have this conversation with this driver at the Olympic Training Center. He calls me. He goes, you know, Johnny, hey, would you come out here in a month, you know, uh, push a bobsled around, see if you like it? I said, look, man, I'll come out. But if my agent finds a football team, dude, I am out of here, <laughs> right? True story. One month before I was uh, supposed to go get my cool runnings on, I get a phone call from this driver. He goes, Johnny, one of my guys has showed up overweight. Do you want to come up now? and compete in the U.S. four-man team trials. Huh. And so I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm like, well, when's the race? He goes, it's in two days. I said, two days? <laughs> oh, no. Man, I've, I've, I've never pushed up off in my life. I live in Texas. We don't really, you know, get snow. We, uh, you know, we're, uh, I play football. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get back in the NFL. And uh, he goes, Johnny, 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 all you have to do is get inside the sled. And true story, I flew up the night before team trials. My first time ever on ice was at the U.S. four-man team trials, and we took third place. Wow. wow. It was unbelievable, guys. Un unbelievable. Wow, that's crazy. And so that started my bobsledding journey, and then four years later, I became a U.S. Olympian. Wow. That's that, an incredible story. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, it was un, 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 yeah, it was, it was awesome. Unreal. unreal. Well, that, that goes back to what Laura said, you know, take action. Why are yes. people not taking yes. action? Yes. And, so think about this. Well, let's walk through that mentally. Okay. Here, here's yeah. what I want. To date, I only know football, right? right. To date, I play, you know, I live in a, in a warm state. So I, I had these fears of, well, you know, um, never Bob slutted before. So I had some uncertainty there. Right. Um, you know, half the time I'm in Europe, how are we going to afford this? So I'm battling, you know, financial fears there. Um, so I, I had these fears and I, and I think in business or, or sport, it doesn't matter that we have these fears and fear's okay until it becomes crippling, right? right? There's, a, there's a healthy fear and, and using that to, okay, stay engaged and, and working on your craft and, um, you know, overcoming odds and things like that. And so I almost kind of took it as a challenge, right? As as a as a unique opportunity. And uh, looking back now, here's what's so interesting. Looking back now, I I I I see the path. But when you're in the messy middle, and I would say that's that's sometimes where we are. You could say that's where we are in business right now, as we all navigate through COVID, whatever that's going to look like. We're kind of in in this messy middle. Are are, are you staying engaged? <laughs> are you right. taking action? Right. That's that's what we want to know. Yeah, and I think yeah, that's probably a very, very small percentage of people faced with that exact situation that you were would have said yes to going right. and getting on a bobsled yeah. two days, before, you know, after the conversation. So yeah, that's, that's a great Here, point. here's what I would I would encourage our listeners to think about. Um, you know, and I'm sharing my story in sport and a little bit of business, but. You know, and I've been through a ton of goal setting workshops. I mean, that's all we do in sports, right? I mean, we're gonna we're gonna win gold. We're gonna win the national championship. I mean, we goal set like crazy and do the same in business. So, to our listeners, I know we've got different backgrounds here. Let, let me ask. Let, let's. I want you to consider this question: what, what do you want life to be like in twenty or thirty years from now? Right. Let's, let's take a long term approach. And and here here's how I answer this question for me personally because I'm in, I'm in a, in a different season of life. In that I'm, I'm married, I have a two and a half year old little girl, and I own two businesses. So in 20 years from now, what do I want? Well, I want businesses to be thriving. Maybe I purchase more, I don't know. But I, I want thriving residual income, uh, businesses just, just thriving, okay? So that, that's my business side. But relationally, I, I want, you know, at that point, I'll be 27 years into a marriage, I, I want it to be stronger than ever. I want when I come home 20 years from now and that garage door goes up, that my wife, her name's Amanda, she goes, Johnny's home. And, and not, oh, Johnny's home. <laughs> See what I'm doing here? Right. You know, I, I've got a two and a half year old little girl and in, 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 in 20 years, she's going to be 22, 23. I, I want a fantastic relationship with her. I'm not going to be your best friend. I'm going to be your, a, a loving dad. And I want that to, to, to thrive. So what I'm doing is, is I'm, I'm, I'm projecting out what I want 20 years from now. So it helps me take the right action steps now. Yeah. Right. It, it helps me put in place. 
well, I, you know, I, 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 I can't, I need to take care of my businesses and I take care of my marriage and take care of my, my, my children, my child. Um, every, what's today, Tuesday, March 9th, decisions I make today are actually going to help me get closer to that or move me further away. And I think if we look at, you know, our careers that way, we're going to get more people to take the right action. Love Does that it. make sense? No, we have it makes, it okay. makes total sense. And to be, to be quite honest, Johnny, and we've never met before, but I've literally lived my life exactly that way. Love and, that. and it's funny because like right now I'm in my home in Arizona because I decided years ago, I don't want to spend the winter in New Jersey. So <laughs> I planned out how sure. is it possible to do something in my career to be able to spend the winter in a warm location where my children are grown and they're successful doing their thing. And me and my husband that are married 31 years are actually able to spend our time at this season in my life the way I want. Beautiful. So a hundred percent, Johnny, you are right on point with those decisions. And just so you know, I know my retirement date also that I have Beautiful. put out to the world that I know the day that that will come. And that is the way everyone needs to live their life. And like you said, not just in business, but also in the relationships and their family life also. And you're right. It makes it much easier to make those decisions as you're projecting the 20 years in advance or 25 or 30 or whatever it is, because how are you going to achieve that if you're not starting today? Laura, you, you are a walking, talking example of that. That is fantastic. I love that. Here's you know this quote. I got this quote from a guy by the name of Dale Partridge. He's out of Oregon. And the quote goes like this, success at work without success at home isn't really success at all and that just hit me it's right it, it, it hit me and so what what it does it just it helps me properly frame because look i you know I, I at the olympic training center we go through all the personality tests we do disc profile yeah. everything oh yeah strength finders listen you know uh, this is our first time meeting and our listeners, maybe your first time to hear me. You can probably tell I'm a type A extrovert, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. Me too, John. Right? There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, this, this, uh, it's easy for me to get committed, right? It's easy for me to go all in, but am I doing it the detriment of my family? That, right. That's not winning, no. right? That, that's not successfully positioning yourself. Mm -hmm. And I would even say this, Lord, you know, to, to our team leaders that are listening here who have staff that, you know, operate under them is that, you know, only in the movies can you disconnect home life from, you know, production in, in the real world. We all know that that stuff carries over. And, and, you know, so in my team meetings, I'm gauging, you know, they might not say it out loud, but I'm gauging participation. I'm gauging tone of voice. I'm gauging. So I need to know, hey, you know, I, I need to go love on one of my staff or I need to go infirm on one of my staff, depending on, you know, what's going on. So it's 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 being it, it's using wisdom with your team, understanding that all this is connected. I what do want to mention. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. One other thing. Right. You spoke about I read this somewhere. I don't know if it was in yeah, your yeah, yeah, yeah. the TED talk, but you spoke about emotions. You spoke about keeping your emotions in check when you have a setback or when something doesn't go according to the plan that you're putting forth. What are some tips on that? Because I think that again ties into why people stop taking action. Yeah. Emotions are healthy, Laura, but boy, can they lie to you. Right, they, they they can lie to you and make you say things and do things that you don't want to do in a clear clear frame of mind. And so when I started to realize that as I got older, and it really happened the first time I got cut. So check this out: I have a lot of success in high school, a lot of success in college. I get to the NFL. I'm 22 years old. I sign a three year deal for 1.2 million dollars. Uh, I'm pretty fired up, and then I get cut, and I lose it. Contract's gone. I mean, you want to talk about emotions just, ba you know, bouncing everywhere, right? He here's what I had to find out. And, and at 22 years old, I became an avid reader. I, I wish I was started earlier, but whatever. That's when I, my entry to books. Here's what I, Lord, this is what I needed to find out. This was so huge for me. I needed to know, are there other men and women out there that have had massive failure, right? Because at this point, this is my massive failure in my career. I've always been good at football until this point. 
And did they overcome it? And how did they overcome it? And so I, I became an avid reader on autobiographies, different uh, uh, inspirational books. And, and here's what I realized, Laura, is that managing your emotions well is almost kind of pre, uh, a prerequisite to moving the ball forward in life, right? It, why, uh, understanding that, you know, I would, I would read books on Abe Lincoln. I'd read books on just, you know, historical figures. And the failures that these men and women went through are just unreal. I'm kind of like, golly, I thought I had it bad, and I don't. And I, I realize that, I, you know what, this is actually kind of the, the, the necessity to success. And so it was at that point, you know, go back to borrowing wisdom, is that I had to learn how to manage my emotions well. And so whether things are going really well or really low, I want to be as cool as the other side of the pillow, right? That, that's the, the, and that's a challenge. And it is, you know, for us type A extroverts, you know, I'm getting fired up here on this call. I mean, it's, you know, it's a challenge. It is. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's go back to, you know, planning and, and putting things out there. So one thing I noticed is people like to compare where they're at yeah. in their season versus where you know someone else is at where they want to be so how do you how do you tell people to plan based on their their attributes and their life rather than comparing themselves to other people mitch great great question um i, I look at it as um a battle like a versus battle i, I call it comparison versus contentment and, and let, let me unpack that because contentment can kind of be a a scary word in a sales role. So I, I need to unpack what a healthy form of contentment looks like. Not because contentment is not complacency. Contentment's not laziness. Contentment is not, you know, un, being unproductive. The, the problem with comparison, Mitch, is, is you're right in that when you look at everybody else and what everybody else has is that it, it's like an Instagram highlight reel. You, you have no idea what they've overcome. You have no idea how they've been resourced, and you're drawing these uh, conclusions, which quite frankly are inaccurate. And so, right. and what you're really battling is this comparison versus contentment. And a health of a healthy form of contentment goes back to this understanding of I'm going to find a way to get the job done with the current resources available. You know, I, I keep going back to that, but it gets rid of excuses. It gets rid of, of looking at everybody else. Right. Um, and it gets rid of this unhealthy form of comparison. Now, Mitch, there is a, a, a healthy form of comparison mind, if, if I may, where, um, let's say, let's take, um, let, let, let's take, uh, let's take weight loss for an example. You've got a friend or a colleague that, uh, is on this weight loss program and they're losing weight and you see they've got more energy and 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 uh they they, they spur you to join them and now you you're, you're on, the, on the track of healthy weight loss and you've got more energy that's a great use of comparison great i would say that's a small percentage of what we do <laughs> yeah, right. right it's very that's a very small i just didn't want to leave that out but the the, the struggle, and you're right, in, in this day and age that we live in, we're all connected, and there's benefits to this, getting things done quickly, is that we see everybody's highlight reel. And it, it, it what happens is it makes you come up feeling um, that you've been shorted or that you've got the, 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 the smallest straw or that, you know, the world's against you. And um, it, it, it's just a false position. It's a false position. Well, the thing that I like when I'm, you know, when we're on social media, like you said, you're seeing other people's highlight reels. Yeah. The the people that impact me the most are the people that share their downfalls. Yeah. The people that share their their mistakes, their struggles. Yeah. And their struggles, because that just shows you that, oh, okay, they struggle, I struggle, we all struggle. You know, we we all know humans struggle, everybody struggles, but like you said, when you're just watching the highlight reel, you yeah. don't see those struggles. Yeah. It, it's kind of like a movie. You know, they they show you the the best parts of the movie. Right. Know? And then it you was, watch the movie and you're like, yeah, about 15 minutes of that movie was great. The other yeah. part was terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's yeah. like, it's yeah. like that. So yeah, I like the people, the leaders that are able to open up and share, you know, that they don't know everything that they do struggle, that they make mistakes and they, and that they, you know, show their failures. There's a quote from a, um, a guy by the name of Craig Groeschel. And it goes something like this. It goes, um, people would, would rather follow, a leader that is authentic, 
that is real than a leader that is always right, right? Because sure. nobody's right all the time, right? You'd rather, you'd rather follow a leader that is real and not somebody who's always right. And Mitch, that goes to your point of being open, you know, and honest about the struggles. And as a speaker, you know what's so interesting? When I go in and speak and I talk about, you know, getting cut in the NFL three times, you know, ended up losing $2.6 million in NFL contracts, blowing out my knee. And, and, and then I interact with the audience afterwards. You know, 99% of those people aren't going to the NFL, right? It's long past them. They weren't even into sports. It's even not even in their radar. But they can relate with a, a business venture going south, or they can relate with a relationship that got destroyed. And so there is something there is something to say about relating and being relatable in our struggles and in our failures and understanding that, hey, that happens and um, y y you can recover. Y you can. And so I think it's just so interesting. I'm, I'm a sports guy, but, you know, although that's how I see life through is it, it, relate, it relates on so many levels because we've all f experienced setbacks or failure in some form or shape in our life. Yeah, I agree. And I think that anybody that's had success in sports, um, you know, can have success in business because, no doubt. That, you know, yeah. because they've learned all they need to know about business and a team and leadership, you know, in their four years in college or their experience in the pros, you know, like, you know, you see people like Matt Ishbia, you know, that was, you know, walk on at Michigan State and, you know, look what he's able to accomplish, you know, by using what he was taught by one of the best coaches in, you know, the history of, of basketball. I love those yeah. stories. Uh, they just fire me up. <laughs> you All right, fired so, up. <laughs> yes, that's right. So, Johnny, what's that one final piece of advice for our audience? What do you want to leave them with? Well, I, you know, I look at 2021 as an incredible opportunity, right? We know last year it was whatever. Or do our listeners believe that 2021 can be their best year yet? And the, the question I want you to ask yourself is, have I spent any time, have, have I carved out time to think about what am I going to complete this year with my team, with my family, with people that I do life with? What am I going to complete? Not just work on, what are we going to complete together? Because if you can bring something into completion, everybody on that team, that organization, you win together. And my background in sports shows me that when you win as a team, it is it is just so much better, right? To share in that with somebody else. And so uh, leave everybody with, what are you going to complete this year? And have you spent some time thinking about that? Who are you going to do it with? That's Love awesome. It. Awesome. All right. How do people connect to you, learn more about? I know you did give the web address. Yeah. Can you share that again? Yeah. So uh, on all social media handles, at Johnny Quinn USA. And then website, johnnyquinnusa.com. And if you're interested, if you've liked some of the content that I shared today, I, I write articles. And so literally johnnyquinnusa.com and just click on articles. And I've got uh, different topics that I write on. I put together uh, short mind gym videos, M-I-N-D-G-Y-M videos during when Corona started last year on how do you protect and strengthen your mindset? Because I, I really believe everything starts with how you process information. So I've got a lot of free uh, resources there for if you're interested. Love it. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. You have been wonderful, Johnny. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing all of your insights and your energy. It is fantastic. Yes, absolutely, man. The energy is uh, contagious, and now I'm ready to go plow through the day <laughs> and, and make some things happen. So There you go. I love I it. I appreciate you joining us, Johnny. Absolutely. Bye, Mitch. Bye, Laura. Take care.